Alicante has been the home of the fully crewed race around the world since a Volvo race built its headquarters here in 2009. Since then, we've seen a lot of changes. Part of the fun of the build-up to any race is wondering what might be in store. And this time, I'd say we know less than ever. Because while we have a fleet of five Amoka 60s, four out of the five are brand new boats that are barely lined up against each other other than in the recent route to Rum. During that single-handed race across the Atlantic and the return trip home, several teams broke quite a bit of gear, which has led to some long days just getting the show back on the road. So not even they know how the next 31,000 miles will pan out. But these boats will be fully crewed for this race too, and we know even less about that. What we do know is that the latest generation of 60s are very different indeed. Crews are totally enclosed and spend their time driving the autopilot while monitoring a mass of sensors and alarms. Shortly after Boris Herman had launched his new Team Milizia last year, crew member Will Harris showed me around. It's a fascinating tour and highlights just how different the new boats are to sail. Plus, he also explains some of the thinking behind Milizia's extraordinary shape. Yeah, I mean, there's so much technical pieces to this boat and it's completely different to the old one, I think. I'll, I'll start off by saying, you know, uh, the way we live on board, the way we sail it, um, and a lot of the kind of uh, technology around the foils and the electronics is, uh, has definitely changed. Um, and also the hull shape is completely different. Um, well, that's what strikes me most <laughs> about it. I mean, this bow, talk us through this bow. I mean, this move to scale bows. We see them in the class 40s. We've seen them in mini transat boats, and now they're on the 60s. Yeah, exactly. So you can see behind me the, uh, the very front of the boat um, and the bow sprit as well. But... If I think back to, if I kind of compare to the old Militia 2, which we sailed on before, um, the very bow of the boat would be touching in the water um, up here. And now you'll see that the waterline actually doesn't start until it's actually 3.4 meters from the, from the bow of the boat. Um, so we're probably the most radical scow bow of the Amoka fleet at the moment in the water. Um, and yeah, as you say, we've seen it in the class 40 fleet coming around to kind of going for this scow bow movement. And, and the real reason for us to do it is because we're trying to get these boats to, to foil and to sail fast in the big waves of Southern Ocean. Um, what the scow bow really helps you to do is to stop the, the nose from plunging into the back of the wave in front, because that's what we're doing all the time. We're, we're, we're sailing faster than the, uh, than the swell at the speed of the wave. So what happens is the bow will lift up over the top. Um, and I can confirm from the few, few, few trainings we've done so far, it, it does work. Um, and it will lift up and allow us to overtake the swell. And, and in theory, you know, when we think of a Von der Globe and an, an ocean race, we're looking for, for average speeds, which are going to be quick in these, uh, in these kind of big, windy and wavy conditions. And, and that's really what's going to help us to, to get through these waves and through the swell. But, that's um, quite a big change though, isn't it? Because I know when, the, the, when this foiling concept first came out, my understanding was actually it was to increase the average speed through the doldrums and through the middle section or the early sections of going yeah. down south and then coming up from the south. But from what you're saying now, that game's moved on and you want to use it in the bigger conditions further south. Yeah, exactly. You know, we learned so much from the last one, Le Globe. Uh, last, last edition was really when we saw the true foilers. You know, we had a big set of foils on our boat. Um, there was 10 or 12 other boats with big foils. And what we really saw is that they can't really use them in these, in these big southern ocean conditions at the moment. And the non-foiling boats are the same speed. So we're we're trying to work around this, trying to work out how do we, how do we take this big section of these round the world races and, and make them as, you know, the faster parts of our, of our race. So by doing this, you know, we're probably going to compromise in a few different uh, other conditions. You know, light winds is going to be a bit trickier. You see that we've got the scow bow at the front here, reducing the waterline length, which isn't ideal for when it's lighter, but also at the back of the boat, you probably won't be able to see it, but we've actually got um, a rocker in the back of the boat as well which is a bit uh, quite different to the other boats. Um, so effectively the whole boat's a big banana. And what that means is it can rock back and forth to get through these waves, but in the lighter wind conditions, um, you end up with more drag through the water. Um, so really it's focused around big waves and, and foiling conditions. You know, we're trying to think about above 10 knots of wind speed. We're really looking to be on the foil and, and to start getting the boat going. So we don't worry so much about this drag. Um, and we're really trying to think of, you know, what's the conditions going to be for these big races rather than, you know, in the summer here, it's, it's 10 knots on the water and might hurt us a bit more then. But, uh, 
overall in, in the in the races it will be it'll be worth it hopefully so so uh, we've got to put it to test really now well the very first thing i noticed and i know this is a trivial thing to say but <laughs> i mean one the cockpit layout is completely different to anything else two you've got it looks what looks like an aft cabin it's like a caravan at the back here doesn't it yeah yeah <laughs> no for sure probably needs a bit of explanation but uh so what we have is we've gone for a, a kind of v2 of hugo boss i would say we've gone for the cockpit being in front of the um aft living area i'd say um so right here is the cockpit and then there's a partition here watertight bulkhead in the middle and then you've got kind of a aft uh, living area under this bit here but the reason for this kind of cabin at the back, I would say, is not actually for comfort so much. I mean, it's a, it's a benefit, but the reason for it is because with the, with the Amokas, you have a 180 degree inversion test. So you need to consider the stability of the boat when it's upside down. So by having this big volume at the top, what we're actually doing is we're making the boat very unstable when it's upside down, which means that we can reduce the weight in the keel, um, and which overall makes the boat lighter, which is a big goal for these foiling conditions now. You know, How do we make this boat lighter? The canting keel isn't actually that useful anymore. Um, once you're on the foil, it's, uh, it's actually a hindrance. It creates more drag. Um, so we're really trying to consider how, how can we reduce weight in the, in the boat overall. So that's why we have this cabin at the back. Um, but obviously you'll see in a second, uh, it's, quite, it's quite nice to live in as well and to have a really good view of um, what's going on outdoors. And that was really the overall concept of our boat. You know, how can we live comfortably inside in pretty extreme conditions um, while still being able to look outside and, and treat it as if we're on deck. So um, you'll nice see to, kind of a lot nice of windows. Nice to live in this, not an expression you often hear. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and yeah, yeah, sure. Follow Oh, you're doing you're doing a test, yeah. Yeah, with this deal. Yeah, I can I can just point stuff out. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is the cockpit of the boat. This is basically where all the sailing happens. Uh, you can see we've got all our four winches um, sat in this bit, and we have the piano as well, which is taking 53 ropes, which allows us to control the entirety of the boat. While, as you notice, we're pretty much completely dry the entire time. So. Uh, we have covers everywhere. We can open the windows at the front for a bit of fresh air. Um, but you know, we've got windows to be able to see everything. And, and what we really imagine kind of the ocean race configuration will be is one person sitting up here like this and another person on the pedestal um, trimming the sails. And this person will be lookout, checking everything that's going on. You know, I have a perfect view of the mainsail and the headsail. But also, I've got my autopilot screen here. And uh, this is where we control all the autopilot. So I'll have all the data uh, regarding the autopilot and you know what I need to control and what, uh, what it's set into. And these are the buttons which you basically use like a, like a, a Game Boy or something or a play, PlayStation to, to control how the boat is steering based on the, the heel, the apparent wind angle, on, uh, on, the, on uh, all sorts of different settings, even the polar as well now. And so one person is sitting here just adjusting this basically. Is that noise a bit too loud? Or is it? <laughs> this is, um, no, that is really, yeah. it looks like quite a precarious place. Yeah, to yeah, <laughs> it's pretty solid, I must admit. Um, and then you also have the tiller, which can come from, which is on deck at the moment. But uh, that tiller is gonna, gonna head, up, head to here and I'll be able to steer the boat from here as well when, uh, when you need it. But it's not very often you need to do this, so most of the time it's on the autopilot. Yeah, exactly. It's all, all copied and then the next is, is obviously all the screens at the front. So we have our main navigation touchscreen, sunlight readable. Uh, you have the BNG Zeus, which is doing the radar and the Oscar camera, um, which is basically our anti-collision screen. It sounds an alarm as soon as we have any sort of boat or object in front of us. Uh, and then we generally use the iPads for the, uh, for the loads page and for also for the, uh, also for the um, cameras to look forward, basically. So. Can you say the loads page? Let me see if I can show it. So, our master dashboard, I say you'd call it. Is it online? 
Okay. So you have here, this is kind of a master page which, um, which allows us to really monitor the, the boat. Uh, we have 300 sensors on the boat. Um, so for example, we have the mast and the hull fiber optics. Uh, we have fiber optics in the foils as well. Um, and then all of these are various rig loads. So you can really be, when the boat's really fully flying, what we're really trying to think about is, are we at the limit? And how much kind of out of control are we? How much are we, we're at risk of breaking the boat because we're really pushing the limits of them. So uh, we're always looking at this screen rather than even looking at other stuff because this is going to give us the most information as to is the boat in kind of a, a safe condition. And, and if we go over any of the alarms, um, then it will sound a big buzzer at the back um, and will kind of tell us and we know, do we need to stop the boat? Do we need to adjust a setting? Um, and I guess from what you're saying, you need this because actually you're at a level where you can't feel that. You're beyond being able to feel whether the boat is... I mean, to, to be honest, the, what it feels like is it feels like the boat's going to explode at any moment already. So uh, you kind of just need to be looking at this screen because it feels like you should be slowing down anyway and you've got to just trust in these numbers being, the, being your actual limit of the boat because, uh, you know, the boat's humming, the boat's uh, slamming, you can hear cracking, you can hear all sorts of noises, but... Unless one of these alarms go off, you you're kind of in trust and in faith that it's uh, that they're all, all's okay on board. So, and is this a standard system across sort of the top end of the fleet, or is this something that you've developed specifically for this? Um, so it's it's becoming more and more in the other iMockers. I'd say we've probably spent more time developing it than the others. Um, for example, the fiber optics. We have 150 sensors around the boat now, so we have fiber optic cables running up the mast uh, through the hull through the composite of the hull and through the rudders and the foils. And this is all measuring the deformation, um, which gives an overall kind of load that's going through these pieces. And with the designers, we work on, uh, you know, what's the maximum deformation and what's the maximum load in each of these things. Um, and in doing so, we can create some alarms and kind of limits as to how hard we should be pushing the boats. Um, generally, it's in the mast, which is the limiting factor at the moment, because they're one design rigs from 2011. And now we have these big foils producing much higher writing moments. So um, the mast fiber optics is probably the main thing we're looking at and also the, the load pins that are in each of the sails. And, and this is generally the, the limiting factor at the moment. So. Really interesting. It must take so long to set all this up. I it's, mean, to have 150 sensors, I mean, they're all yeah. going to be calibrated. They're yeah. all going to be linked in. And it's a, it's huge, a job. huge job. We have uh, our software engineer, Axel, working on this. We have a, a Pixel Summer who de develops all the uh, kind of interfaces the XSET Blue to be able to, to put all these sensors together into a, into a software that we can use it. But yeah, Axel's working full time to get all the alarms working and functioning. Um, and then there's the whole overall installation of everything as well, making sure everything's working. So. Amazing. And I yeah. guess some of this technology also is, is coming across from the L teams and the multi LC. And the America's Cup quite a lot as well. So, um, yeah, through kind of the development of fiber optics in, in composites and, and using it to measure what's, what your overall limits is, uh, we're really trying to work on that. But obviously the, the multi cars that are here as well, they're also doing big work on this as well. So. And I would imagine that from a sailor's point of view, it's quite a task in itself just keeping up to date and getting your head around what you need to be looking at, what the relevance is and how you control it. It's just a new world. Exactly. To be able to push the boat at 100%, you really have to be a, a bit of a computer expert now to, you know, to, if you think of a 40 day leg of the ocean race, there's going to be some sort of problems with these electronics and, and unless you're 100% confident in your, in your alarms and your settings, then you're not going to be great and pushing the boat super hard so so by understanding it and being able to fix these things is really important now to be able to, to push these boats but also it makes them very exciting yeah amazing <laughs> yeah amazing. Yeah. <coughs> yeah welcome to the living space yeah <laughs> so uh yeah you can see this is that that kind of cabin area that you saw uh you saw on deck and you've got all these windows to be able to to look out and you know check that everything that's going on at the back of the boat. I can even look at the uh, the reefs from here as well, which is super handy. Um, and to be able to check everything and, and have a quick look out when we're when we're maybe off watch and uh, kind of not, not in the main cockpit area. But this is where the crew during the ocean race will have a bit of uh, time off. So you've got you've got three bunks on either side. This will probably be the the onboard reporters bunk here, um, and then you've got two more up down the side in the kind of more darker areas of, uh, 
of um, of the boat. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of space, um, a lot of space back here. Um, it's pretty pretty basic still. You know, we're we're considering how we're gonna how we're gonna mount everything still, but. Um, and then right at the back here, you have your two autopilot rams. Um, so we have two completely independent electronic systems, uh, one connected to one ram and one connected to the other, um, and that's connected to the, to the steering system, which is, which is going outside. Um, you've just got the aft ballast tank here as well, which we imagine to help use for that rocker, you know, that banana shape that we spoke about earlier. That will really help to lift the bow of the boat out when we fill this tank. So that's for those really big wavy conditions. Um, so just under, just kind of in this central living space, um, under these boards here. So, so at the moment, so you see these, these fibers are a little bit different color, and that's because these are sustainable fibers, they're flax fibers. Um, so after their life, they can be broken down and, and uh, you know, recycled, um, which obviously is how we're trying to move forward in the Zamokas. And we've got 100 kilos of this flax fibers on the boat now. Um, so they cover basically our two independent electronic systems. So I've got one under here. And then you'll see the other one is just on this side. So this is all the different sensors and this is our autopilot computer. Um, and all our electronics are kind of based under these panels to get the, the, their, their weight as low as possible. Um, and two completely independent lines. So should we have a problem on one line, we can immediately go to the, the other line on this side. But um, it's all quite protected away and um, all kind of centralized to try and keep the weight all together. So this is, the, um, this is the foil compartment, I would say. So we, we've just walked just in front of the mast. Um, if we just look behind us quickly, this is the mast bulkhead. Uh, we've got all our electronics that come from the mast, which are, which are all here. And you've got the tunnel, which bring all the ropes from the front of the boat. And then if you just look up in here, you see under this plastic cover, we've got the foils. And you'll see that curvature of the shaft. They're currently fully retracted and how they kind of come right to the center of the boat. And that's all living up in here. Um, yeah, then you can see all the structure that's, that's going on around the, uh, around the foil and, and kind of the whole foil trunk. Um, it's been by far the most complicated part of the boat um, to be able to deal with the loads um, because the foils are creating so much force in the boat. Um, but at the same time, we have to think about there's the mast sat directly above it and you've also got the canting keel directly underneath it as well. Um, so all the structure in here has been through so much testing and design to really think about um, every sort of situation if we were to have a collision or a, um, any sort of problem with the keel and, and that's all really what's taken the longest part of the boat I would say to, to have people putting in all the structure with this. Um, you'll see there this is our, our Hydrans compass, it's a very high tech um, fibre optic compass which we're using for the autopilots to to understand the movement of the boat down to the nearest millimetre basically to, to be able to steer, help us steer the boat um, as well as possible. So this is what we're using all the time for the autopilot to, to be able to make these autopilots steer so well. Um, we've got our ballast system which is uh, controlling the ballast side to side which are about a ton, 1.2 tonnes on either side. Uh, and then we've got our ocean pack just like in the old boat which is um, what we use for collecting our science data and which is constantly sampling the water from underneath the boat, um, measuring the CO2, the salinity and the temperature and then we send that back to shore to be uploaded to various scientists and databases around the world. So um, that's what we've got here basically. Um, so we don't spend much time here but it's a very important part of the boat. <laughs> yeah. The cavernous space, yeah. So now we're, for, we're, we're forward of the foils um, when we're in here. And that's really where we're trying to put all our stacking weight at the moment when we're in a, when we're in a flying mode. Um, so you'll see either, either side we've got these big stack nets. And uh, this is where we imagine to stack the sails most of the time, um, either side here, uh, because we really want the weight to be forward of the, uh, forward of the foils to, to deal with that kind of wheeling effect of the, uh, the foils are having without the T-foil rudders at the moment. Um, and we're even considering going even further forward to the next bulkhead. Um, but what you have to really think about is, you know, this, the movement up down in this area when the boat is flying is about two or three meters. So while you're walking around here, you're regularly getting thrown against the roof. So you've got to really be careful when you're working up here. It's completely pitch black. There's lots of, uh, lots of sharp points and it's, uh, 
It's not designed to be spent much time in, for sure. <laughs> you don't want to put a bunk up here. Um, and then you can see here the tubes going up to our uh, forward ballast tanks as well. So that forward ballast tank is about 11 meters from where the, in front of where the mast is. So. What's different compared to the old boat and the other Amokas is how much space there is, you know. If I stand up here, I can have my full head height, whereas probably a lot of the other Amokas, the deck is somewhere around here. Um, and the reason we've gone for such a high kind of free board on the outside is because when we think about this plunging into the front of the next wave, um, what we don't want is the bow to go in and then keep following down. What we, by having more volume up high on the sides, it allows you to, uh, to not do this and you know, stay out of the water. Um, but also it's for the 90 degree rule test as well. It, it's helpful for, for that. So we lose in aerodynamics by having this um, and more structure and more weight but we gain in, in other conditions. So um, we've really had to consider what it's been like from the previous Von der Globe, and we've really tried to use our own experiences as, as a team to, to think about how to develop this rather than just looking at the computer model. So we're at the bow of the boat at the moment. Um, you can see I've got the bow sprit in front of me. And what we have is we've got two separate furling jumps uh, to allow us to have two uh, kind of head sails up at the same time. We've got a choice of of eight sails on the Amokas, eight head sails. Um, and so we're constantly changing between them. So the biggest sails will be on the front, right at the end of the bow sprit. Um, and then a bit further back, you end up with the, uh, with the J2, which is sat just here. Uh, this is the sail that's permanently up in the air. Um, and then after that, you've got the J3 and you've got the J4. And, uh, and effectively, once you start foiling, you're almost straight away onto a sail that's no bigger than the J2. Um, and even smaller than that J3 often, because once you start flying, you don't need the surface area anymore. It's a bit like the America's Cup boats. Um, the only conditions where you're foiling and uh, with a big head sail is downwind really. So um, that's all done at the front. Nice big space on the, on the front of the boat. We've got a, a camera and a light here as well, so that we can see the furling and the trimming of the sails. Um, and that's just shining a light up on the front of the boat. But overall, we've got seven cameras on the boat. So to be able to do the trimming, to be able to uh, to film everything that's happening basically, to, to be able to tell the story of what's going on on board as well. So um, that's super important. But I think we, we really tried to make this part of the boat quite similar to the old one. You know, we were really happy with all the rigging and everything that, that went on up here. So uh, things that work, you don't really want to change. So um, we were quite happy with it. Given the, um, when you talk about, you know, the foils starting to lift the boat and getting the boat out of the water, do you feel that sense of acceleration? Is it a bit like a multi-hull where it starts to lift and then everything starts to multiply up as the apparent wind speed builds? And what, what really starts to happen is you feel the trim of the boat starting to come up. You know, the trim will go from, what I'll tend to watch first is how the trim goes from level to about three or four. Because when you go from a pre-foiling to a foiling mode, you tend to have uh, five degrees of foil rate to get it lifting. And then as soon as you start foiling, you have to start reducing that. So to stop that weeding effect. Um, but along with it comes a lot more movement. You know, the boat is moving in every different direction at this point. You know, on a sailing boat, normally you just feel the, the slamming, but as soon as you start foiling, you start getting this overall circular movement, I would say, which, which makes it pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but then also you, you have the noise as well. You know, the foils really are quite deafening. You know, the sound of them humming through the water is, is pretty loud. <laughs> and is there a sort of particular true wind speed that things start to ramp up? Uh, it's from about 12 knots that we really start foiling. Uh, 20 knots is probably when it feels most uh, on edge, I would say, because we're still pushing the boat at 100%. Um, we're trying to go as fast as physically possible, basically. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, yeah, we're not slowing down yet. So, and the boat is really at full power, I'd say, at that moment. Um, sometimes when it's 25, 26 knots in the right flat water conditions, it's pretty fast. but. Uh, yeah, from 12 knots upwards, we're feeling the effect of the foils. They're, they're definitely helping us and we're starting to foil. And then, yeah, from then on upwards, you're just constantly adjusting them to get them in the good mode. So, so uh, what we have thought about on the new boat is how we can put more solar panels. Uh, you remember last time on the old boat, we had quite a big solar array compared to the other boats already. Um, but we wanted to go more so we could make the boat more autonomous off it. So you can see we've got it on the entirety of the roof here, but also we've got it on the deck. And the way that we made it grippy enough is we've, we've stuck this kind of non-skid um, non uh, sand, I would say, which is almost exactly the same as the grip on the, on the boat itself. Um, and we've done some testing with Solbion to get it, to get it all working and, 
and uh, make sure it's it's working well and it's so far it's been fantastic you know we can safely walk on the boat and move around and we've been able to put about two and a half times the amount of solar compared to the old boat so um, the idea is that we can basically be autonomous with just the solar panels by themselves and in total all of them together weighing about 47 kilos so uh, you know if we think we're saving the weight of diesel for a around the world trip it's uh, it's definitely worth it so um, we're really happy with how this has worked out. And you've so still far. got hydropower though, so you've got what and see generators. Exactly, yeah. So we've got some hydrogen hydro generators, nanos they're called now. So they're a bit smaller. Um, they don't have the um, hydraulic regulation um, because what we were finding was the speeds of increasing and decreasing, it wasn't able to keep up with the regulation. So now they're just a much more basic, uh, much more basic kind of pitch system which allows us to just generate energy the whole the whole time and consistently without problems. So. Um, between those two, we should be able to power the boat the whole way around the world. So.